And away we go. It's the DFS Early Bird presented by Awesomeo.com. Dan Strafford, Dave Lockman along with you on this Monday morning. A nine-game NBA slate is ahead of us. Dave, how you doing? How was your weekend? Oh, doing good, man. Doing good. Had a good NFL weekend. Um, I, I, sometimes I do this. Sometimes I do that. This week I decided I was going to play you know, higher entry fees with less lineups. Um, just played three lineups across the board and and did pretty well. Uh, finished, you know, I mean, nothing, nothing crazy, but some good scores. I think my best lineup was two hundred five. Uh, had some solid, solid production. I will say though, of the three lineups I played, damn, I had my only three lineups. But I had, you know, Michael Thomas in two, I had McCaffrey in two, I had Hunt in the other, I had Kamara in two, I had Kelsey in two, or in one. Um, but I did. I had Cooks in one, Julio in one point in and Chubb in all three because he was just too cheap but I didn't have that one lineup with all of them right right if you know and of course the the, the millionaire maker winner I think had Adam Humphreys and he was nowhere on my radar anyway and who knows if I would have even been able to make all of them fit right uh plus I had like Kamara McCaffrey lineups and a McCar- Kamara Hunt so it doesn't really make much of a difference but point is uh in order to to really hit big money in NFL you can't just have most of the right pieces. You got to have all of the right pieces, especially with how high scoring it's become. It's really crazy. Yep. Uh, right there with you uh, where uh, five lineups uh, didn't have Humphreys either. So I uh, will cop to that pretty clearly and never had the inkling to play him in any way, shape or form. Yeah, I'm not going to play him next week either. Right. Uh, but uh, did have, uh, you know, the, the game stack obviously with the Rams and the, the Saints with some other pieces that, uh, turned out to be a decent lineup. I think it was 198 was my high scoring lineup. Very nice. So, Very nice. Uh, hey, can I can I just say by the way, uh, how ridiculous it is that Minnesota Minnesota Timberwolves seem to be intentionally late scratching guys. I mean, it's happened like three times this year already, just out of Minnesota. It's ridiculous. It was a uh, Derek Rose Sunday night, right? Like he was active, yeah. but they said just before the game. Yeah, game yeah. And, and fortunately, I didn't play NBA today. I had the, the serious show from seven to nine on Sundays. So I just played a little bit of the later, the late slate one. It started at nine. So it really meaningless money, but just the idea is that a lot of people did get burned by that. I did have rows in both lineups, but not not a big not a big issue. It's more so the principle that like you have warm ups, you know, you have shoot around. You have to know whether this dude's playing or not before nine o'clock. Like right. I, I get that they don't live for DFS players. I totally understand that, and I'm not asking them to, but. Uh, Come on. It, 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 when it's happened, I think there's been like four or five late scratches this season and three, like four or five meaningful ones, and three of them have been from Minnesota. At least two. Stupid. Yep. Uh, seems like a pattern. <laughs> Eventually yeah. you need to uh, trust uh, people who – and by the way, uh, before we finish here, I did not watch, but have you been watching The Walking Dead this season? Um, I'm watching this season. Yeah, we watched the first two episodes. I think we're two behind. Yeah. Uh, Justine and I just finished uh, the first half season of Shameless. They're splitting it up because it's 14 episodes. And uh, I don't know. Some people might not like it, but but I love it, man. Shameless I, the last, is awesome. Uh, it's so good. The, the, I'm saying this season they might not like it. If you oh, don't like okay. Shameless altogether, you're you're a buffoon. But this season, the, the final two episodes, they went, they're going seven and seven. It's coming back in January. The final two episodes really pulled it all together and made it a real nice way to finish. So if you haven't seen the new season of Shameless yet, I would definitely recommend it. As far as Walking Dead, I'm too far gone now to stop well, watching it. You're pot committed. Yeah. yeah. Correct. We're, yeah. We're, we're there too. Uh, got word that tonight's episode was very good, but it's also from okay. my sister-in-law who is like a full-fledged like yeah like she'd be on the couch at talking dead right exactly right. so i i'm hoping the best uh but it's been it's been rough thus far to to watch this season and, and hell some of it's still entertaining uh but it's just bad bad television <laughs> so yeah it's it's not what it used to be that show used to be really good yep um and it struggled and obviously uh, everybody knows that uh, rick grimes is on his way out uh so mm-hmm. uh and what's her name is on her way out from Shameless, which is equally disappointing. Right. Yep. Actually, more disappointing because Shameless is still fun to watch. Yeah, Shameless is a crazy show. They're just well, the cool thing about Shameless is that you can pretty much just keep going on with the progression of their lives and you know just show us all the craziness. With The Walking Dead, it's there's only so much you can do in a post-apocalyptic world right. um, until it's like, all right, that makes no sense. That's crazy. That's just stupid, and that's boring. You know. 
Yep, absolutely. So uh, we will. I'll report back when we, we finally watch uh, this one, uh, and we'll go from there. We are we're in though. Like it's it's. I'm gonna have to be in this one to the end. Um, if I was watching this binging, like if I was trying to catch up, I probably would stop watching. I'd probably treat it like I did Lost, where I was just like, you know what? <laughs> I, I, yeah, not easy. I'm not not easy to do. I'm all done. But all right, let's uh, get to these nine games. Uh, don't forget, you can use the promo code Early Bird, one word, uh, over at Osmo.com to get one week free. Uh, so absolutely everything on the site for free: the the rankings, the projections, uh, the uh, letter grades from uh, Alex himself uh, for each sport. Uh, obviously, NBA in full swing. Uh, with Dave and Adam, uh, you have Josh and, and Spags and, and Eddie doing some of the live shows. Uh, so you get uh, tons of content there. And then, of course, uh, you have NHL, MMA going on, PGA still going on as well. And then all the NFL content uh, each and every week. So lots to, to digest over there using the promo code Early Bird, but hopefully it gets you to understand what we have. And, and then you have the free shows over there on YouTube that uh, tie it all together. So let's talk a non-game NBA slate. We'll go position by position here as we often do, well, as we always do, really. Uh, let's see uh, if uh, – I hope the Pats lose tonight, but I don't know if that's going to happen. I do, too. But... It would help the Eagles, actually. Um, you know, if it comes down to a wild card spot, Patriots just punched it in the end zone. It's 24 se- – well, 23-17. All right, let's get this baby moving. All right, so we have uh, at the top of point guard, obviously, Russell Westbrook takes on New Orleans, 11-1, the price tag there. And you have Steph, uh, Kyle Lowry, Chris Paul. James Harden is multi-position eligible, obviously, between point guard and shooting guard at 10-7. And uh, Drew Holiday, Victor Oladipo, just north of your 8K uh, ceiling here at 8-2. Levine, Conley, Irving, and on we go. Uh, Lots of good matchups here. Some uh, high-end spots for somebody like Russell Westbrook at 11-1. Uh, is that where s- sort of it's easy to start with Russ uh, in this matchup with New Orleans with uh, pace up and and a decent price tag at 11-1? Yeah, let me come back to I hit the injuries real quick. I think this sure. one's pretty important. Uh, Kawhi Leonard says he feels fine. Uh, so that foot injury seems to be nothing. Like they held him out this first game. Uh, and as of now, Dan, we are in the third quarter. The, the Raptors are just obliterating them. They were up 45 to um, – they were up 34, 35 to 10 at one point, 42 to 17. That was in the first quarter. Uh, and then the second half, just ridiculous. But anyway, uh, Butler should be back. Kawhi Leonard should be back. Both of them were out tonight with quote-unquote rest uh, or quote-unquote foot injuries for Kawhi Leonard. Uh, Jeff Teague is another one. He we, he could be back. I don't know. Derek Rose was a late scratch, as we just talked about. So we'll have to keep a close watch on him with the ankle soreness. But you know that's a lot of that's a lot of names right there for for Minnesota that that um, bear paying close attention to in this game against the Clippers. Now Donovan Mitchell has already been ruled out, so that's a big one right there. Um, there was another one too, another important one. Uh, Alfred Payton is already ruled out he should be back or at least expect, expecting him to be back on Wednesday. Uh, Tim Hardaway left the uh, Sunday's game with a, with a back injury, and his status was kind of up in question going forward. So he is questionable. Looked like he tweaked his back. He played through it, though. He came back and played through it. But, you know, on the second game of a back-to-back against Chicago, there's a good chance that they just sit their top scorer out and, uh, and have him come back on the next one. And then finally, uh, Eric Gordon is out. That's confirmed. And then Whiteside and Dragic, both for Miami, both of them are questionable. So that's a, that's, that's, there's a lot then. And, and Anthony Davis is probable, which means questionable, doubtful, or out. We're not sure yet. But there's definitely a, a, a lot of news to keep watch on, a lot. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, obviously, we do have the Slack chat that's associated with uh, awesomeo.com if you are a paying member. So uh, you get all that news uh, as the day goes on, people sharing. Uh, if you are not, you can always uh, follow the beat reporters of your favorite teams or, or all the teams, I guess I should say, uh, over there on Twitter. Uh, coming back to point guard, and we have Russ here at the top at 11-1. Uh, obviously, a matchup with New Orleans. Uh, this is Westbrook uh, coming off of what – Almost 50 point outings in four straight games. You have 49.75 DraftKings points back against Phoenix. Uh, and then uh, 
He's uh, at 11-1, though, so a price point that uh, needs a, a pretty high output when it comes to fantasy points. Do you like this matchup uh, with that price point, or do you think point guard has more value below that makes it worthwhile to fade Russ at, at 11-1? Yeah, so Russ in his last game had 54 fantasy points, and he did it in 26 minutes because the Wizards are a terrible team. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I really liked him in that game. It's not like he disappointed us because he wasn't that expensive, but you know, let this guy play in a close game, please, so he can put up some monster numbers because <clears throat> one of the last four games that he's played has been competitive, um, or at least competitive throughout the entire game. If if you want to look to Westbrook here, I have no issue with that. I expect this game to be close, especially you know, assuming Davis plays. Even if he doesn't, it should be. The the Thunder are actually four and a half point favorites, which really surprised me quite a bit. But yeah, Westbrook very much in play here. We'll get to Harden at shooting guard. Stephen Curry against minute against Memphis. You know, if Curry's price was down for matchup purposes, I'd be on board here, no doubt. But he, it's not. I mean, he's been outstanding, no doubt about it. But I don't think you need to pay above 10K here on Curry. He's 10-3 on DraftKings, 10-7 on FanDuel. Can you play him? Sure, you can always play Curry. But it's not a spot where I'm chomping at the bit to do so. Um, outside of that, the top guys, we can talk about some of them at, at shooting guard. There's one that we're going to dive into pretty deep. Uh, I don't think Mike Conley's a terrible play. He's been pretty good. It looks like he's you know finally fully healthy from that Achilles injury that held him out for the entirety almost of last year. Um, Memphis plays this team close, the the Warriors, and look, it, that probably won't happen here. But uh, they do a few things well. They used to be really good at just slowing things to a crawl. I think you know Warriors fourteen point favorites. Memphis team doesn't have the depth that they used to, so it's tough to fall in love with Conley. But I do think just because it's such a pace up matchup for this Memphis team that it makes him pretty interesting. Um, Jeff Teague, if he plays, look, Jeff Teague is forty eight hundred, Dan, forty eight hundred dollars. Yep. And Jeff Teague, who's been out since the twenty ninth of October, plays and isn't limited. And with Thibodeau coaching this team, I don't imagine he would be. At 4,800, you're just playing him, right? You're playing. He's going to get 30 minutes. It's not like Thibodeau is looking to play Tyus Jones for all of this, these minutes. And it's, it's possible that Derrick Rose doesn't play either. So that would lock Teague in. And, and I don't really care tournaments or, G, or cash games. The ownership here isn't going to phase me a whole lot because he's a point guard, not a small forward. He is going to handle the rock. He is going to run the offense a lot. All of that really bodes well for him. At 4,800, you'd be crazy not to go here. Uh, I don't even care if Teague hasn't been good this year. His price tag is still way too low, given what he can produce. Uh, Neil, uh, Neil Aquino is a fine play at his price. The guy's upside really isn't there, but Chicago can kind of you know, uh, heighten anyone's ceiling. I think we'd agree on that. The, the position's not as deep as you would really suspect it to be. I mean, can you look at DJ Augustine against Cleveland? Sure, it's not. You know, that's not the worst spot you could go. There are going to be players that are cheap and offer some value. But I think one of the biggest things, too, is we also need to wait on Goran Dragic uh, and his status because that could change a lot heading into this slate. What do you make of uh, Lou Williams here? Has had a, a coming off a good game, but a price tag of 5,700. Just not enough minutes, right, uh, for the Clippers at present for Williams to be any sort of real factor at 5,700? Honestly, no. I think... The <clears throat> excuse me. The minutes are are definitely concerning, but and I'm not necessarily sure why this is the case. I mean, t well, the Orlando game was a blowout, so 21 fine. Lou Williams coming off the bench, he's the type of guy that that is hurt most from a blowout because you know, whereas some guys will just lose their last rotation, he's going to lose like a rotation and a half, you know, and and that's definitely painful coming off the bench. The reason I think Lou Williams, and I was going to talk about him at uh, shooting guard, sure. but I don't mind talking about him at, at point. It doesn't matter. Uh, the reason he's viable at, at this price is because while his minutes have been down from last season, I might remember so many injuries to that Clippers team last season, Lou Williams has a 32.2% usage rate this year. I mean, if you just look, um, if you just look at the league and, and which of the, and, and these guys averaging, what's he averaging? How many minutes? 25, right? Yeah, or wait, no, less than that, huh? Yeah, it's less. Um, 23 and a half. So let's just take every player that's, that's averaging 20 or more minutes per game. Okay, and let's see where Lou Williams ranks 
in usage because my guess is he's, he's up around the top 10. Uh, Lou Williams ranks one, two, three, four, five. He ranks seventh. Ranks seventh in usage. So, yeah, even if he only plays 25 minutes, there's a possibility that he takes 19 shots like he did in 24 minutes against Philly. Uh, and for that reason, where he's coming off two perfectly fine games. Uh, and, he, and he hasn't really killed you this season outside of maybe once or twice. Yeah, Lou Williams is not a crazy play to me, Dan. And uh, pl- plug him in at shooting guard preferably. But against the terrible Minnesota team, uh, the only concern here would be a blowout. But with Butler expected back, I don't see it being a huge issue. Uh, what's, uh, does that game have a line that we, uh, the Clippers Timberwolves, a few games don't have lines right now. And, uh, this is one of them. Okay. All right. So, uh, we'll keep an eye on that obviously. And to Dave's point makes a lot of sense with all the moving parts on injuries and, and Butler sitting out Vegas waiting, uh, probably a little bit uh, into the night, uh, into Monday morning to have a line released on that one. Obviously, we are recording Sunday night. It's good to be able to actually admit that five years later. But um, none, nonetheless, uh, I guess Williams can be a transition here over to shooting guard uh, where you do have Harden Curry uh, eligible. Kawhi is shooting guard eligible on DraftKings. You have Drew Holiday, uh, MPE, Jimmy Butler as well. Oladipo, pretty much your, your top end of shooting guard all the way down to Gary Harris is your first shooting guard only player and then you throw clay thompson into the mix of 5900 as shooting guard only as well uh still i talked about clay last week 5900 feels like a, a low point uh for thompson just from again the high upside we've seen in the past that um may not be the best matchup but a price point that he could overly exploit uh, uh with some high uh, upside for points here but what do you got at, at shooting guard top end and then um, making your way down to the mid tier? Yeah, so if I'm paying up at, at a guard position, it's going to be Westbrook over Harden. It's not that I don't like Harden. I think he's fine. I don't think it's the greatest of matchups, but I think this game stays very competitive. Uh, so give me, give me Westbrook over Harden. Uh, this game, by the way, looking at the total, 213.5. Man, that's low for a Houston game. Uh, Indy is a one-point favorite at home. So there you go. Th- this game should definitely uh, be competitive throughout. Uh, from a pace standpoint, too, it's kind of funny, Dan, because Houston this year uh, ranks 20 or they, they are like 26th in pace, the fifth lowest. And uh, would you believe me if I told you the Pacers rank dead last in pace? I would I, I would believe you because I believe you when you say things, but I, that would surprise <laughs> me if that yep. were the case. Yeah. yeah, both of these teams are bottom five in pace this year. You know, I didn't expect the Pacers to be. You know, leading the league, but I didn't think I'm, I didn't expect them to be this slow either. That said, I still have some interest in Oladipo. You know, if you played the Ola, sub sub eight k Oladipo rule against Boston, always consider him against or under eight k. And you're like, yeah, but I don't want to do it against the Celtics. Well, he gave you fifty point five fantasy points because he was below eight uh, yeah. k. Now, Dan, that doesn't mean he can't have decent games above eight k. And I can because I expect this game to be very competitive. I'm pretty interested in Oladipo here as well. I still think he's a little bit underpriced. Uh, I also think Zach Levine, even though his price has come up, is in a really, really favorable spot here against the Knicks. A bad Knicks team. Levine has not finished with fewer than 30 fantasy points this year. He's finished with less than 33 only once, uh, and that was a 30 spot uh, in a blowout loss by 29 points where he only played 26 minutes. So if this game stays close, Levine's playing upwards of 38, 39 minutes. He's taking 20-plus shots. He's going to give you around five or six rebounds, five or six assists, a steal or two. I have no problem with that. He has easy 30-plus real point upside. Uh, He's attempting a lot of threes per game. He's also getting to the line at a high clip when he's he's out there playing solid minutes. Uh, If we're talking about usage, too, we just mentioned Lou Williams. Zach Levine is third in the entire league. Uh, right basically neck and neck with James Harden. So, yeah, while Chicago might not play at a lightning fast pace either, they don't. They're bottom seven. Levine is still eating up a massive amount of their usage of their possessions. I'm sorry. And that to me is a big factor here. He's still relatively affordable, too. Uh, crazy to see. And I, I just filtered by uh, 150 minutes or more on NBA. Uh, so you're seeing sort of uh, someone like Joel Embiid has a ton, which is insane to see how many minutes he's played already this year, over 300, 350. But just wow. filtering that way that you have Lou Williams, Levine, Harden, um, Walker, Oladipo. It's all, all guards all the time here on the usage uh, 
list except for Embiid. Embiid's uh, in the top yep. 10 here. And then you have Blake Griffin and LeBron just outside the top 10. So here's another one too. Um, he's basically, he basically has the same usages as Oladipo, Curry, Griffin, <clears throat> LeBron James, DeMar DeRozan, Lillard, so on. Uh, is Tim Hardaway. If he plays, and that's a big if, you have him against the Chicago team that is so dreadfully bad, anyone can, can just destroy them. And that, that bodes well for, you know, kind of like a pure shooter like, uh, like Tim Hardaway. So, you know, Chicago, just really bad defensively. Not a team that I worry about defending the perimeter well at all. They're not going to be able to defend them on drives. It's a good spot, excuse me, for Hardaway. But I guess the question is, do you want to pay basically the same for the Levine, you know, or, or just pay up a little bit more for, for Oladipo? Um, or do you want to play Jimmy Butler here, who remains underpriced? Jimmy Butler still offers quality value. He's only 8,200 8, on DraftKings. And, uh, you know, when, when you're getting him at those type of price points, Butler is always very viable. We don't have a line here yet, but this game also should have a pretty, pretty close line for sure. Yep. Uh, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, Hardaway Jr., you mentioned earlier with the injury. I guess he was need in the back is what I read when the injury happened uh, and uh, went down to the floor and was never quite the same the rest of the game. I didn't see it. Um, yeah, so I mean, can... that could be a reason to not play him. Back injuries, you play through, but you can obviously tell that they're hampered by it. So a bit of a concern, especially now that his salary is increased. So uh, something to keep an eye on. And if he doesn't go, as you mentioned, you have Nilakina and you have some other guards there that might be of interest uh, simply because of price points where uh, the usage will be up for grabs uh, with that next team. It's a pretty, pretty bad roster. So <laughs> there's shots to go around. Uh, any other shooting guards worthwhile before moving over to a small forward? Yeah, I think Fournier against Cleveland is very playable. I mean, you want to talk about bad defense, bad teams. That Cleveland's one of them. And you kind of just got to, I hope and pray that, that Fournier is on his game because if he is, he should be able to demolish uh, this Cleveland backcourt. I don't see it being a huge issue. You know, Jamal Murray and Gary Harris, those guys are cheap, but I just don't really feel like going to them against the really, really good Boston defense. And I, I, I just want to point out, too, that uh, Dante Axum, big disappointment last game with mm -hmm. Mitchell out. But he also, let's at least be honest with, with this, the situation. He, number one, only had eight and a half fantasy points in 19 minutes. So that's just bad, no doubt. But he also had three fouls in his first eight minutes and didn't come back in for the first half. So it's really hard to say what his playing time would have looked like. Uh, and we can't really – I don't think it's fair to go by a second half rotation because we have no idea. Mitchell's out, but Alec Burks is returning. So because Alex Burks was out last time, you're like, all right, well, that's another body that's off. You know, they no longer have Hood. Mitchell's sideline. These, this guy, this guy, and this guy should get minutes. What they'll do with them, we're unsure of. But, you know, Alex Burke could come in. Alec Burks, I'm sorry, could come in and play like 15, 20 minutes, and now he's siphoning more uh, playing time away from those guys. It's not an easy matchup with Toronto whatsoever. So I think you kind of just avoid that spot. Uh, and outside of that, there isn't much. The, the only other guy I'll point out from a value standpoint, outside of Damian Dotson, and that's because he's facing a really bad team, we talked about how bad the Chicago Bulls defense is. And he has, doesn't have a high upside, but he's also posted a pretty decent floor. The only other guy here, uh, and it's not to say I feel confident in him, but he is very cheap, would be Patrick Beverly. Uh, Bev's played around 26 to 30 minutes in close games this year. The Clippers have not played a lot of close games, though, and that's the thing. Uh, Pat Beverly, not a high upside guy, not a trustworthy guy, but at 3,800, could he give you 28, 27, maybe 30 fantasy points against a bad Minnesota backcourt defense? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Uh, and you're not going to see Jimmy Butler guarding him either, which means that he might see a few extra shots funneled his way. Other than that, value is pretty rough at shooting guard. Not, not a value play here, and I believe we talked about him last week, me sort of being uh, completely dismissive of playing him just because of personal bias. But what do you make of Josh Richardson this year? Uh, this is a guy who's putting up some big minutes first and foremost for Miami and has shown a, a 46, you know, almost 50 point upside on DraftKings price point is high up to 7,500 here against Detroit. Maybe not even on this slate, but are you a believer that this is a sustainable offensive output from Richardson? Or do you think this is just simply a small sample to start the year that will uh, average out as the year goes on? I mean, there's a couple ways to look at it first. 
it's hard to see him taking around 18, 20 shots a game. That definitely, you know, let's say, let's say around 17, 18 shots per game on average. That that's hard to believe he's going to sustain. Um, but second of all, this is a Miami team that even though they, they use a ton of bodies, there's nobody that's really dominant here. You know, Goran Dragic is not a dominant scorer. Dwayne Wade, you know, is having a pretty decent season, but he's not somebody that's going to play a ton of minutes. He's not someone that's going to jack up a ton of shots anymore. You could go throughout the rest of the lineup, whether it be Magruder or, or uh, Winslow or, or Olenek. You know, those are all guys that will get some opportunities, but they're not usage hogs. They're not usage hogs at all. Neither is Hassan Whiteside. He does most of his damage on the boards and on the blocks and on putbacks. So, no, I think Richardson you know, can sustain a solid pace. This pace, probably not. But uh, if Goran Dragic plays, by the way, I just don't really have any interest in playing him at that price point. All right, uh, let's uh, continue on here to small forward, where again some of these shooting guards will be eligible, and we'll we'll do our best to to make our way through. Not mentioning repeat offenders here, but it does come to pass often on DraftKings. Have you played on FanDuel at all this season? Like no, as a like as no, a concerted I effort? I haven't. I've been playing you know exclusively on DraftKings. I, I might try it out. I just really don't like the format now. Right. That's where some I was going like with that it. question. <laughs> yeah, some people like it, and I'm not hating on them at all. Like, if you enjoy it, that that's great. But you know, if Anthony Davis gets scratched, right. uh, or or even your mid range guys taking a zero, the format doesn't really account for that. It's it, it and, and basically you're already punting someone because you know your lowest Inten- score. Yeah, intention. Yeah, yep. yep. Uh, look, I haven't played it, so I'm not going to speak like I know the ins and outs of the strategy for Fanduel. But I do know one thing. <clears throat> that if Anthony Davis is ruled out uh, and they drop your lowest score, that doesn't really mean dick because you're still dropping the lowest score of a guy that was expe- projected to score your most points and eats up 25% of your salary. Yep, that makes sense. And uh, I, I will admit I have not played uh, uh, either over there. So there may be some diff- different strategies with going more balanced uh, to, to protect against some things or, or obviously on – each slate is going to be a tiny bit different on who's available and what minutes are there for uh, an absolute punt. But uh, nonetheless, let's uh, talk here about small forward. Reason uh, FanDuel was brought up because small forward typically has been uh, the barren wasteland of DFS, especially over there on FanDuel uh, as you try to piece together two uh, small forwards on any given slate. But uh, KD, Kawhi, Paul George, Butler, Miritich uh, with AD, uh, Hampered has had uh, a nice run. You mentioned THJ before. Richardson's uh, available here. Tobias Harris. Uh, Joe Ingles is up at 6,700. And then you get into a mix of talented uh, upside guys who may not have the best of matchups uh, with the likes of uh, Andrew Wiggins. And then you have Fournier, who you mentioned already. And we go on from there. But top end, obviously, you have some talent with uh, KD. Kawhi sits at 9,200. Paul George at 88. And then Butler at 82. Is this another day? Dave, where Kawhi at 92 is tough to play when you have Jimmy Butler at 8,200 for 1K less uh, as a possible play? Yeah, I mean, in cash games, you're not playing Kawhi Leonard, but I think he's an interesting tournament play. I mean, there was just no way that, and I know people were talking about doing it, but there was no way you could justify playing Kawhi Leonard in any format over Durant the other day when he was, you know, in in the five figures, he was 10-1, and Kevin Durant was 9,900 against Minnesota. Uh, and that, look, I'm not going to say, oh, well, we were right because Turan had a much better game. But just in general, like, it's very rare that you're going to play Kevin Durant over Kawhi Leonard at a comparable price point, and Kawhi, Le- and, and Kawhi Leonard is going to really make you pay for not rostering him. You know, I feel the same way here, but he's also about $1,000 cheaper than Durant. The matchup's not easy at all, but I do think, you know, he's obviously rested. He sat out yesterday. In tournaments, this is a spot where I'd be willing to go to Leonard just because he's so damn good, uh, and people are going to avoid him entirely on this slate. So that makes sense. Uh, Durant doesn't have the easiest matchup either, but I do like him. Uh, how much of him will I have, or how much of him I'll have is, is yet to be seen. I can't imagine I'll have that much, uh, but he's still, he's still fairly priced, and that's what matters. I mean, 10-7 on FanDuel is fine. 10-1 on DraftKings is perfectly fine. But I like some of the mid-range, too. I think Tobias Harris against Minnesota. Just a really bad Minnesota defense, man. A bad Minnesota team in general. Uh, I just have no faith in them to be able to stop him 
<clears throat> or anyone on the Clippers. So this, this does stand out to me as a good spot for Tobias Harris. And I don't think he's crazily overpriced. I'd like to see him below 7K, but you know, what are you going to do? Uh, Jabari Parker, I've been saying this so often since he got moved into the starting lineup, but Jabari Parker, man, he's going to have some, he's going to have some bad games. Um, just because he moved into the starting lineup does not mean that we should expect monster numbers from him because now he has to share the court with Levine for the majority of his minutes. And that really hurts. Uh, and now Wendell Carter Jr. is rebounding so much better than he did a few games into his, his rookie campaign. I mean, you look at this, Jabari Parker has played 70 minutes over his last two games, 70 minutes over his last two games. Okay. And he's averaging 0.54 fantasy points per minute. He had a 20 and a 17, just really bad. Peripherals have been awful. Um, he's, he's, he's just really bad. Actually, no, I'm sorry, Dan. I'm sorry. He's played <clears throat> 106 minutes over his last three games. And he has, oh my God, um, he has 54 fantasy points. So you do the math. It's not good at all. Uh, that's 0.5, so 0.5 fantasy points per minute. He's still too cheap. I, I do believe that. I think Parker's still too cheap. But I, 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 won't, I'm, I wouldn't make an argument that he's actually perfectly fine and, 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 or maybe even overpriced. Like I wouldn't, make, I wouldn't try to argue against it because he's looked so bad. So we'll throw him into the mix, but he's not a guy you love. I'll also talk about, you know, I'll save him for the next one and just give you a couple value plays. Uh, Gallinari, along with Harris, I actually might prefer him over Harris because you're getting him at a steep discount from him. Uh, Chetty Osman is not the guy we thought he was earlier in the year. Or actually, no one should have thought that's who he was. Right. But, I, I, yeah, I, I don't hate him here, but I think you can do better. I'd rather go to an Evan Fournier uh, if given the multi-position eligibility. And – if, if you're looking for value, you're probably not going to have much luck at small forward. And Jabari Parker will still be talked about. Um, you're going to you're going to have some people playing uh, Kyle Anderson against the against Golden State. He's played 28 and 31 minutes over his last two games. I actually do think this is a really viable play uh, at a real cheap price point. I think Anderson might be your best value. It sounds really gross, but you know, very much a pace up affair. You have Memphis in terms of pace playing at one of the slowest in the league. Right now they rank 29th, while Golden State is unsurprisingly playing at a top 10 pace. This does benefit Kyle Anderson. He's not good, but he's cheap enough to where I don't think he's going to hurt you here at all. And, and uh, any interest in or, or starting to at least track the, the games of Gordon Hayward here? Uh, seeing minutes slightly uptick, seeing double-digit shots in, let's see, four of his last five games. Anything uh, that you think Hayward might be in line to uh, start to create a, a good offensive output here for the Boston Celtics as he gets more and more uh, back from that gruesome leg injury last year? Who is this? I my my uh, my microphone yeah. or my headset went out for a second. I heard, I heard uh, some buzzing. I don't know what uh, that was. That was really weird. It, it made me panic a little bit. Um, this uh, laptop will self-destruct in five seconds. Uh, <laughs> Who are you talking about? Gordon Hayward. Uh, Double-digit shots over the past four games. Minutes seem to be slightly up, ticking, uh, and a fifty-one hundred price tag here against Denver. Yeah, I don't hate that at all. I actually think that's a nice play. Uh, are you going to get thirty minutes from him? Uh, they have enough bodies to where it's probably not necessary, but right. Gordon Hayward at 5,100 against Denver, that, that's a play that, you could, that I could definitely get behind uh, for sure. It's, it's risky. You're definitely not playing Hayward in cash, but it makes sense in tournaments where he's so cheap and is ultimately going to have one good game pretty soon. He's just too good to not have you know, a blow-up performance if his minutes and usage keep climbing. All right, uh, let's talk power forwards next. Obviously, a uh, few have already been mentioned in talking about small forwards. You have the ongoing will he, won't he of Anthony Davis. He is listed as probable for Monday night's game with his sprained elbow, which I guess I read he, he's saying he hurt uh, when dunking on Jared Allen uh, a couple of games ago. So good for him. I mean, it's a good, it's a good reason to be injured, but uh, kind of frustrating uh, for his season long owners and obviously those who have. Uh, been hit by uh, trying to play him and having him uh, end up not going in some of these games. You have Durant, obviously eligible here, but then it's Blake Griffin, uh, Miritich, uh, Draymond Green is on this slate at 7,400. Julius Randle at 6'6". Uh, if AD were to not go, 
uh, stands out a bit. And then you have Gallinari. Aaron Gordon uh, is 6,500. Not necessarily too deep a position here at the top end, at least. Uh, who's, who's standing out for you here at Power Forward? Power Forward's actually been the worst position on the year. I mean, I really, I really believe that. It's, it's been the worst position on the year. Um, you know, initially you look at Davis's matchup and you're like, man, that, I don't like that against Steven Adams. And I still don't. But uh, he's, he, he has not been hampered by having to go up against Adams. Actually, his point totals over his last, uh, what is it, six games. No, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five. Over his last seven, hell, I'll even use nine, Dan, against, uh, against OKC. 41, not fantasy points, real points. 41, 23, 30, 37, 34, 38, 36, 43, 25. Uh, rebound totals of 11, 10, 15, 7, 14, 15, 6, 3, and 10. So, I mean, there are he is putting up a ton of points against Steven Adams and OKC. And, you know, that happens when you're as dominant as Davis is and matchups mean a whole lot less. So, uh, yeah, if he's active and we don't have anything to worry about, I'm not against playing Davis here. And I think his ownership probably remains very low while most people go sure. to someone like Westbrook. That makes total sense uh, as you get uh, closer to lock. Obviously, Osmo.com does have – Ownership projections, uh, which uh, get updated throughout the day. A first run uh, gets posted, and then as you get closer to lock, they will be updated uh, with some uh, updates throughout uh, that 6 to 7 o'clock hour to make sure they are as accurate as possible. Helps uh, you get an understanding for GPPs especially, and even you know uh, cash games, when to be on the same plays or making sure there's somebody that you shouldn't be fading. Uh, so you can check that out with the promo code EARLYBIRD. Again, uh, one word over at awesome.com who else here at power forward uh beyond ad guys that uh you mentioned galinari already i think tobias harris is uh, both small forward power forward eligible uh so we have some definite crossover here but who are some of the other names uh that stand out as potential plays at power forward i mean how do you ignore aaron gordon here I, I just I don't see how you can. I, I know the guy has struggled at times, and that's going to happen. You're going to get some really bad games from Gordon once in a while. I mean, hell, that game against the Clippers is as bad and as low as you're going to get for Eric Gore, or Aaron Gordon, just no question. But he also has just such immense upside to, to where avoiding or ignoring him at 6,500 in a home matchup with the Cavaliers just seems reckless. I mean, the, I don't see how you can't love this spot because of his price point. The Magic are only four-point favorites. They're not a good team. Aaron Gordon's price has cut, has dropped like a like a brick. I mean, look at it's uh went from let's see seven eight eighty two hundred. Then like a week later, it was at seventy one. Then it was shot back up to seventy two after being in the six K range. Then sixty five. This is easily the cheapest he's been all year. It's a bad position. I think Aaron Gordon opens up a lot for you. I like him in cash and in tournaments. I think Gallo here, we mentioned him already, is a perfectly fine play. Um, Jason Tatum's not terrible, but I just would rather go to Aaron Gordon. I'd rather pay a couple of extra dollars uh, and get up to, to Aaron Gordon. It just seems way too logical uh, to not make that move. Now, a lot of times the logical move doesn't pay off. And with Aaron Gordon, a lot of times he's going to burn you. There's no question. But I'm all right taking that risk. I think he's he's too good. He has too much upside. He, he produces in a, a a number of different categories, not just in points, not just in rebounds. He can really do it all when he's playing well, and that's something that stands out to me. If you're looking for a dirt cheap punt at power forward, uh, he, you're not going to get him at power forward on on Fanduel. Uh, he's small forward, but he has two uh, multi position eligibility on DraftKings. Is Stanley Johnson? It's gross. You know this guy has never lived up to his you know lottery pick status. But he's also played 30, 33, and 35 minutes over his last three games. Uh, and just being out there on the floor long enough will give him an opportunity one of these days to give you that 30 fantasy point game you're looking for. Are we at a point uh, with I, – I don't know that I really want to bring this up. But are we at a point where uh, a price point of just above 5K is reasonable to consider someone like Carmelo Anthony? Is he settling in to that second – uh, offensive unit role and, and being the primary scorer on that uh, roster? Or do you see that just the, the way those rotations are working uh, and the way that uh, Harden and Paul will, will dominate the ball when, when on the court that Melo may not uh, be viable here at 5,600? Look, he's played well. There's no question. But now that Harden's back in the mix, it's hard to, to get on board with that. 
do I hate it? No, but I don't see myself having a lot of it. Uh, again, because you have decent value here at the position with Aaron Gordon and such. I mean, Draymond Green's another guy where you know, he was sub, six, sub 7K, and at that rate, you just had to play him. You just had to keep playing him. Uh, and he, he, he rewarded you with 49 fantasy points, 43 fantasy points. Now he faces Memphis. Not nearly as easy of a matchup, but Dre's the kind of guy that can't do You know, look, he's averaging over his last two games a triple-double. Uh, obviously, the average doesn't mean much, but the point is that he, we know that he contributes in all of these categories. You know, his last two games, he has a combined 25 points, 23 rebounds, tw- uh, 19 assists, four blocks, and a steal. You get, you get production everywhere from him, which should help against this Memphis team. The only downside is it's a pace down matchup uh, and he's going to lose pose- possessions to, you know, get swipes, get assists and, and get rebounds on. But I still think in terms of price point, Dre gives you enough to where you can uh, at least consider him a decent mid range play really in any format. And we can tr- transition there to center as uh, Draymond Green, obviously center eligible. Don't know that you're playing him necessarily at this position, but you do have the likes of Jokic at 9,400, Vucevic at 87, Drummond is at 86. Carl Anthony Towns, after two really solid games, has uh, dropped back down to earth a bit here at 8,500. Gobert, Gasol, uh, and then Capella at 7,700. Whiteside carrying the, the questionable tag for Monday's game with a right knee injury. Keep an eye on that uh, here against Detroit. Uh, I do love following uh, Joel Embiid's uh, harassing of uh, <laughs> Drummond. With uh, he has he's selling real estate in his head and he's building new new buildings and and so on and so forth. But uh, center pretty deep with talent, uh, obviously with some uh, major upside uh, for uh, big outputs from some of these guys. Who are some of your favorites? By the way, before I forget, I did want to say Alfonso McKinney uh, over on DraftKings is power forward eligible only he's thirty three hundred dollars on Fandle. he's small forward and thirty seven hundred so just a couple hundred dollars above the minimum on both if you think this game is going to be a blowout if you think it's going to be a route you know the warriors are 14 point favorites and you don't think the starters are going to play uh, meaningful minutes in the second half mckinney is actually interesting in each of their last two blowouts and i mean big blowouts uh, he's he's played 27 and 27 minutes so he clearly is getting uh, an opportunity to develop off the bench when the Golden State Warriors are taking commanding leads in the second half. And that's exactly what we've seen here. Now, uh, is it a lock? No, absolutely not. This is a guy that is super risky. But if he's going to play 27 minutes in big blowouts, I don't mind having him on the radar to sprinkle in there in the event that this game does get out of hand uh, early. So just wanted to say that. Uh, we've talked about a lot of the guys at power forward uh, that, that have eligibility here. <clears throat> I think Carl Anthony Towns is still in play. His price has actually come down to 8,500. That's hard to ignore. It's really hard to ignore against the Clippers. You know, Boban is, is one of these guys that you can play him again. You know, even though his price has come up to 45, you know, if he plays 23 minutes, you're probably not worried about that $4,500 price tag. That's just, that's just the way it is. And you look at his permanent production for his career, and it's absolutely through the roof, right? With, with, this, with the Spurs, with anyone, wherever he got minutes. You know, per 36, this is, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been, I, I've been losing my voice, and I don't know what's going on, but uh, my apologies. His per 36 is for his career, DraftKings points, 46, 50, 50, 45, 40, 55, and 55. So that doesn't mean much in terms of upside or ceiling, because you know he's not going to play 36 minutes. Right. But if you get 23, 25, actually, by the way, I think you could get more, I think you could get actually more minutes than 23, maybe 26, 27, because that game where he started was the second of a back to back. And he played 23 minutes the night before that as well. So Bowen might actually get good minutes here. You're not worried about Carl Anthony Towns' defense. But on the other side, you're not worried about Marjanovic's defense. You're not worried about, um, somebody like March and Gortat, if he's in the lineup, but you're not worried about Montrez Harrell. So I think both bigs, assuming Boban starts are very much in play for this game. Um, I also think you can look at Whiteside here, but I worry about uh, the fact that, you know, he's dealing with the knee injury and that's not good for a big man. So I'll probably end up getting away from that. I, I don't think it's a spot you need to go to. 
Uh, Clint Capella, a little bit pricey for me still, and not the best matchup against a quality defender in Miles Turner. But we get Vooch against Cleveland. And you, again, would you rather play Vooch at 87 or Towns at 85? I'd probably take Towns, but I think that's the way everyone's thinking, which makes Vooch really interesting against the terrible Cleveland team. This is a good position, Dan. I mean, Wendell Carter Jr. is another one. This guy is not letting anyone down. His price has come up to 6100 but his production is soaring through the roof, and he's getting huge minutes in competitive games. Wendell Carter Jr. is still not uh, priced to, to – his, his price tag does not reflect his production, uh, and until it does, we're going to continue to play him. And a matchup here, uh, most likely with Mitchell Robinson in the starting lineup as the Knicks have gone to the youngster – uh, to see what he has, uh, Cantor coming off the bench, seeing fewer minutes, and Robinson uh, is is raw. So a uh, matchup here for Carter to potentially exploit a little bit. And I know Carter's young too, but uh, Robinson not necessarily a great block defender yet. Low block defender, he's, he's very good shot blocker, but uh, relies mostly on athleticism, not really necessarily uh, – skill set quite yet so it'll be interesting to see how they match up in this game and whether or not Cantor gets a little bit more run if the Knicks can keep this one close I'm pretty sure the Knicks are minus three favorites uh at least at present in that matchup so. yep they are in minus three also uh, um Dan Mo Bamba is kind of interesting mm-hmm. because number one he's gonna play you know 20 24 minutes 20 23 24 minutes uh that's pretty certain regardless of score But Cleveland's so bad that Orlando could take a commanding lead here, and then Bamba gets like four extra, five extra minutes in the fourth quarter. So I don't think he's a a terrible punt. Uh, Obviously, I will pay 4,500 for Marjanovic, though, if he's in the lineup. Uh, Boban has just been too productive. And you still have that good value with Wendell Carter. You know, Carl Anthony Towns is also still too cheap. So position's not as deep as usual, given the the matchups for some of these guys. But I do like a lot of these spots uh, for some of the cheaper centers. and. If Whiteside's out, Drummond's value also goes up because you know then you're facing a very soft and undersized front court for the Miami Heat. All right, uh, that will do it. As always, don't forget to stay tuned for all the injury news. You do have the NBA strategy show uh, early in the morning with Josh and uh, guest. I don't know if it's you or Adam or if Josh is flying solo on Monday morning, uh, but uh, none Should be Adam. Should be Adam. Uh, Ship my money DFS over there. Uh, on with Josh getting you ready. And that show will go long. They'll go as long as they need to to break down the slate. Uh, seeing uh, upwards of 120 minutes on some of those streams on uh, the morning. Then you have uh, from A to B, which is Ad, uh, sorry, Andrew and Ben uh, doing their football slash golf slash uh, sports at large show from 2.30 to 3.30. Then you have the deep dive. And then you have uh, live up until locked where you have Josh and Doris Bags along with uh, Ed Fear getting you ready for uh, lineup lock as they head ho- towards home. So that's all free over there on YouTube, also on Periscope. You can check that out. But uh, if you want the behind-the-paywall stuff, the write-ups, the projections, the rankings, all that, uh, you need to sign up. Use the promo code EARLYBIRD to, to get a taste uh, for one week for free. As always, you can find Dave on Twitter at Lofty underscore D, L-O-U-G-H-Y underscore D. Myself at Dan Stratford. It's Osmo underscore com. If you want to check out uh, the Osmo Twitter handle over there. With that said, we wish you the best of luck on Monday Slate. You get Emac and Adam on Tuesday. Dave and I are back on Wednesday morning right here on the DFS Early Bird.